We've all been very focused on how to stay healthy these days, but uh, we've not been talking about hydration. If you get coronavirus, flu, or even experience allergies, cold, a variety of everyday ailments, they all need hydration. And that's why it's a perfect time to welcome our friends at Hydrolyte back. This is a great product. You all know I've talked about it for a long time. This was the hydration product I wanted to invent, and they got it there before me. Now, remember, dehydration can make you feel sick, even a slight amount, and none of us need that anxiety right now. So stay well hydrated. I am thrilled to welcome our good friends at Hydrolyte back to the show. Longtime fans remember my obsession with Hydrolyte, which is literally the best hydration product I have found. I'm even more excited to introduce their brand new single serve powder sticks. Simply pour one powder stick into a glass of water. They recommend seven ounces. The powder dissolves instantly and creates the perfect balance of sodium, glucose, and water to deliver up to four times the electrolytes of your typical sports drink. And think about it. You can take this anywhere. You should have it on hand to just pour it into water, and you have a real significant hydration product. The other great news about Hydrolyte, the powder sticks, they are 100% natural, no artificial flavors, colors, or sweeteners, and they are available in flavors like orange and lemonade, and they taste great. Hydration is crucial. Hydrolyte is the fastest and easiest way to stay ahead of it. And you can find Hydrolyte powder sticks in the digestive aisle at Walgreens or Amazon or simply just go to my website, drdrew.com slash hydrolyte. Again, that is drdrew.com slash H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E. You see it spelled here. There it is. And you enter the code drdrew18 to save 30% off your order. Forget the runs on toilet paper. There should be runs on this. This is doing much more for your health than toilet paper. So go get some, have it on hand. If anybody in your family gets sick, you need to keep them hydrated. And that's how you do it. Hey, everyone. It's a dose of Dr. Drew. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome. Let's get everybody on in here. Um, happy Passover to those of you uh, who are, uh, and happy Easter, and happy, uh, what other uh, holidays we have coming up? It's funny, those have had uh, developed. Passover. Yeah, I said Passover, and that's uh, getting more, more meaning these days when we are having faith that we will get through this. Uh, we are going to have, uh, are, you know, I don't, do I have the information on Richard here? Is that all this stuff? No. Okay. I could love that. Uh, <laughs> I we will, to we, get that. We'll have our charity represented in just a minute, but let me do a quick hey, recap. Hey, Caleb, can you run to the um, printer? The printer? I think I, I don't know if I printed it. I hope. Here, let me text it to you. You can text okay? it to me or just email it to me, whatever I'm you please. I'm sorry. Oh. Not a problem. It's uh, one of these days and uh, we appreciate you all stopping by and, uh, Let's get some information out there. You said so, you knew everything. Uh, and so the <laughs> COVID-19 update, we have about 426,000 positive in the United States, 16,000 pending, 14,000 deaths thus far. Um, in the uh, University of Washington, covid19.healthdata.org, uh, we are three days from peak in daily deaths. So these are the, these are the tough, dark days that we have to tolerate numbers that are really hard to look at, but that we are not going to get worse. And it looks like we're going to be on the backside of this in a couple of days. Uh, in terms of utilization resource, they're saying two days for our peak need for that. There are some areas that I'm still worried about. I'm worried about Massachusetts. I'm worried about New England generally. Uh, New England is you know, heading into uh, a peak in 10 days, and they are going to stress their resources. Uh, there, it'll be interesting to see if their projected death rate holds at about 200 per day at the peak. Um, because I have been speaking to a lot of doctors around the country and there are some very creative improvisations going out there that are having marked effect on the course of this illness. Uh, same thing with Connecticut, 13 days to their peak death rate at about 137 and, uh, their resources again, stretched, uh, peaking around April 20th. So let's, uh, thoughts and prayers for Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts. And, uh, as I've said before, New Jersey has been really struggling though, um, they're two days to their peak, and it looks like they're going to meet their demands. Uh, there's a lot of variability in their projected death rates at roughly 279, peaking in three days. Uh, we will see. We will see how that uh, ends up. Hopefully, again, that will start to drop dramatically as our therapeutics start to have effect. What's that, Susan? So the information's on your email, but um, Richard Ayub's banner has all the information on it. Okay. So. So let me uh, proceed with welcoming our guest, Richard Ayub, Executive Director of Project Angel Food. You can go to angelfood.org slash COVID-19 to be a part of the solution. And uh, I've known Richard and Project Angel Food independently for years, and now they are together. It's like uh, Reese's <laughs> Peanut Butter Cup. Richard, thank you for joining us. 
<laughs> I love it. I think I'm the chocolate part. Uh, you're the peanut. That's <laughs> I think I think I think I think you're the peanut butter and the angel food is the chocolate <laughs> wrapping. And so so tell us about angelfood.org. It's a great organization and what people can do to make a difference. Well, uh Dr. Drew, so great to talk to you again. Uh I think you're amazing and you, I'm glad you're doing this. It's very helpful for everyone. Project so. Angel Food I believe we were born for this moment. We were created 30 years ago, 1989, in response to the AIDS crisis. Marianne Williamson wanted to make sure people dying of AIDS got nutrition and also love. I did not know this was a Marianne Williamson project. That's very interesting. How fascinating. She's the founder. Yeah. So uh, we had a kitchen at the corner of Fountain and Fairfax in Los Angeles, West Hollywood, uh, at a church there. And it was 100% volunteers Mm. cooking, delivering meals, and nutrition to people. 30 years later, we have ourselves another pandemic, and we continue to cook and deliver meals uninterrupted. The one difference today for the first time in our entire history, is we have asked all volunteers to stay home and stay safe, and we have hired some out-of-work chefs and servers to complement our kitchen and our dispatch areas so that we minimize the amount of people coming into our facility and minimize the risk and potential of spreading the virus. Congratulations, man. It's it's a great... Before this all went down... um, how were things going and how have things changed as a result of this? Obviously, I get the non-volunteer piece and the hiring food servers, but has your mission changed? Has the the nature of what you have to worry about? Obviously, the COVID piece, but, but you know, for instance, you know, the homeless thing is shifting. It's shifting to motels and a lot of, lot of things happening all of a sudden because of this virus. How is that changing what you guys are doing? So we, we expanded our mission to serve everyone with a critical illness a few years ago. So we are serving the people who are the most susceptible to contracting COVID-19. A majority of our clients are over the age of 60. Mm. Many of them have heart disease, lung disease, or diabetes. That is a very vulnerable population. This is the population you want to stay in their homes and not try and go to grocery stores are the ones who really need to stay there. So we were delivering the meals to them. And for the first time in our history as well, we have a no-touch policy. You know, we're a very loving, gregarious, embracing organization where we do handshakes, high fives, even hugs. Yeah. But now we're keeping six feet away, no contact. All our drivers are wearing gloves and surgical masks or you know, some kind of face covering. And we've actually been doing that for more than two weeks, probably about three weeks now. It was just an added precaution that we've done. We also do temperature checks of our drivers and our chefs and everyone who works here. I do I do think sure. thermometers are going to be the new normal. I, I want to, I, I told the thermometer or, uh, company, I want to promote the, the, thermal scanning so we can just as you walk into places people scan you get your temperature so we can at least have some threshold of some information as people start to emerge from the quarantine well that that's a great idea and we purchased several of these scanners that you put on your forehead yeah and uh those have been very very good obviously not everyone with covid has a uh, fever but it will you know, help minimize it. And obviously, if someone has a fever, we will send them home. We haven't encountered that. Everyone, you know, even if people have sniffles, we ask them, stay home, take a break today, it's okay. And we've also asked all non-essential employees, you know, some people in nutrition services, some people in our development department to stay home sure, uh, because we we don't want them to, you know, be in this building. Let's have fewer people here. So how can people be of help? If they want to contribute, it's angelfood.org slash COVID-19. Is that 
Is that the site? That That is where they can help. And I've got to tell you, my biggest concern today is there are 417 people who have reached out to us since this started and who need food, and I want to get food to them. 417 people. If you add that up, it costs $750,000 to feed them all for six months. Wow. It's $1,800 a person. So I need $750,000. I want to get Oof. them fed ASAP. Wow. You know, these people are vulnerable. These people have some kind of illness. They cannot shop and cook for themselves. And all of our meals are medically tailored. Good. So if you have diabetes, you have a special menu. If you have renal disease, which is kidney failure, we have a meal that reduces potassium, phosphorus, and sodium. If you have congestive heart failure, you can only have two grams of salt a day yep. in all of your meals combined. Yep. Yep. And, yeah, and h- how do clients find out about you? How do they reach out? Where do they where do they get the information? And how did that happen? So they can go on to angelfood.org and clients just self-refer. Or if you can have uh, your caseworker, social worker, someone like that. Refer. Because all of our clients have an illness where food, because we believe food is medicine, food will help them hopefully get back. And, and are you, uh, these numbers are getting a little staggering. Are you able to meet the needs right now? Are you, uh, are you uh, struggling to do so? Where, where are you guys? Cause I feel like usually you guys were cl- clicking along. Is this stressing the system? Well, we we're serving 1600 people a day, mm. 12,000 meals a week. We have capacity to do more. The only thing standing in the way is funding because we have to hire more chefs, buy more food, hire more drivers, all of this stuff. So that's the only thing standing in the way. So So we can go to 2,000 people a day. In fact, I think we could actually go up to 3,000. So Um, We just need the community support. So angelfood.org uh, slash COVID-19, and you will uh, quickly see the website that's easy to contribute. It goes right into their uh, their kitty, so you can uh, be, and they'll show you how many meals and how many clients you're providing meals for. It looks like uh, any amount would go a long way, so please do a part of this PayPal, credit card, whatever you like there. Um, Richard, how long did how, you get involved? This is a very uh, significant uh, career change for you. How did this happen? Well, uh, Drew knows I used to work in television. I was a TV producer for many, many years. I always had, in the back of my mind, I wanted to make a bigger difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, I worked in television news for 17 years, and there were times when I asked myself, should I stop this and do something that makes the world a better place? I got into TV news to make my small part of the world a better place. And as I went from El Paso to Tucson to Orlando to L.A., it kept getting bigger and bigger, and I felt the impact was lesser and lesser. And so I started getting involved with nonprofit. I started a little nonprofit called Friends of Lockwood, where oh. me and some friends adopted an elementary school. And every year we take 50 kids to Disneyland Wow. And because I thought, you know what? These kids live so close to Disneyland, yet to them it's so far. Mm. And so let's help their biggest dream come true now so they can dream bigger. So I did that, and I was on the board of the Trevor Project for seven and a half years. And one day, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who helped start Friends of Lockwood. He said, Richard... This might sound a little odd, but we're changing the leadership at Project Angel Food. Hmm. He was on the board. He still is actually on the board here. And he said, we're looking for someone new and 
we need someone with compassion, someone who can tell the story, someone who's not afraid to ask for money. And I think you would be amazing. Would you ever consider being interim executive director? Mm. And right. like when you ask yourself all your life, should I stop this and do something that makes the world a better place? And then you get a phone call that allows you to do that. My answer was yes. And that was how long ago? Almost five years ago. Wow. Fantastic. Congratulations. All right. Well, and Richard, I love it. I'm very, I can very tell. I, I can tell. And it's, uh, and thank you for doing this work and congratulations for angel food. I, I, I think anybody locally here in Los Angeles would immediately recognize the name. It's interesting, you know, the reason I got on the radio was because of HIV and AIDS, and uh, the reason Agent Angel Food Project exists is HIV and AIDS. I, I was, and it was Dr. Fauci back in the day, you know, urging doctors to get out there and educate about AIDS and AIDS transmission, and and uh, that's what motivated me to stay on the radio, so. Wow. Well, isn't that crazy? Isn't that great? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm re reliving that history now. Uh, now here we are in a whole different pickle. Uh, and that was a very dark well, chapter, when, very dark chapter that oh most people don't God. remember. Oh, yeah, it was beyond, beyond. No, you and I remember, yeah, but luckily most people don't. Yeah, I, and I, I guess I so. just want to say that I invite you and Susan to come join us for Angel Awards, hopefully in September. All right. We want you to come and be my guest. All right, we'll Absolutely. do it, 100%. Thank you, Richard, and uh, I will hold you to that. And uh, let you go back to your, your important work. And uh, again, we will send people to angel, projectangelfood.org slash COVID-19. You can donate there. See you, Richard. Thank you very much. All right, buddy. Take, Take care. Take care. Bye. Okay, everybody on the restream here. I see you guys. Uh, Monique, uh, I see your story about your mom. Wow, that is heavy. Uh, I hope she's oh, hope she's okay. Um, I, 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 Monique pointed out on the... On the uh, thread here that her Monique, who? Monique Wellen oh, on yeah. this thread, who, is, who that her mom was a paranoid schizophrenic had been on the streets oh. and we, uh, I'm hoping that this is this is the group that I'm once this COVID thing is over with I'm going back to try to get us to develop more sane approaches to people with these chronic mental illnesses that die on our street every day uh is it worth discerning um thank you uh Kay Decker How's Atlanta doing? Okay, I can give you some information about Georgia because I was looking at that yesterday and I thought, it, if I remember right, it looked pretty good in spite of uh, the beaches now being open there. Uh, let's see, they are peaking in 10 days, 11 days. Uh, they're going to meet their resource demands quite quite readily, but that's going to be about you know 4,000 people in the hospital. Uh, maybe more than that. Let me see what that number was again. Uh, was it 8,000? 4,000 people in the hospital. Uh, and then the death rate is... Um, got a large variability to it. It's going to be about 10 more days, uh, the peaking in the 80s. Um, it's going to it's drop down to 28. And the question is, will it continue down? Uh, we will see. Uh, again, I'm wondering if people are, doctors are coming up. I'm going to uh, put a doctor on the stream. What is that going to be, Susan? Do you know when that? I don't know. I've got a doctor that's going to talk about some of the novel, novel therapeutics. Yet. I spoke to him yesterday on my, my Fox 11 program. And it's very interesting, this uh, phenomenon of essentially a, what we call a cytokine storm. There are anti, some of those, you know, all those drugs you see on TV, uh, you know, for psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's disease and all these things. These are those kinds of medications uh, and that whole, whole so sort of class is being used by rheumatologists right now to decrease the kinds of cytokine activations that we're seeing in the cytokine cascade. And some doctors have come up with some novel markers to see who's getting into trouble with that, and then they're applying these medications in novel ways. Uh, I'm trying to get a hold of some rheumatologists to see if they can speak to it, but it's the intensivists that are having to improvise and figure out these things. Uh, but they are doing so, and it is working. Uh, and most of the intensivists that I'm speaking to here locally in Los Angeles are getting people off the ventilators. They're getting them off, and they are surviving it. Uh, uh, last week, that was not so much the case. So I'm wondering if we're going to see a real decline in the death rate in this country at some point if these novel therapeutics, including things like hydroxychloroquine and antivirals, start to uh, have their benefit. Uh, the University of Washington, Dr. Murray's graphs have not adjusted today. Uh, I find it kind of astonishing that the way the press is um, questioning him, uh, surprised that 
graphs and data are adjusting to the current reality. I mean, that's what that's what models are. They adjust. I mean, the model, you know, the original models were worst case scenario. I knew that wouldn't happen. I knew we would adjust and improvise and figure things out. Now, the new models are based on where we were. The ones I'm looking at now are actually from two days ago. And then as we progress, they will, you know, they will adjust based on where reality goes with the virus. So don't be surprised as these, um, as these models shift around. Right now, the total death, uh, remember, originally was predicted at 2 million, then went to between 100,000 and 225,000. It's now predicted by these models to be 60,000. Uh, might be lower, again, if we get these novel therapeutics going. So things are looking good. In California, things look remarkable. Uh, our shutdown here had a marked effect. Uh, one of the interesting bits of um, data that's running around um, is that, again, always listen to the CDC, always listen to Dr. Fauci, just let Dr. Burks, Dr. Fauci be your North Star, as I've suggested from the beginning. But now we also have these, these graphs we can look at that seem quite, quite credible. Um, uh, there's some interesting stuff going around, running around. I don't know what, whether to uh, put any credibility in it just yet, but that California may have a higher level of herd immunity than the rest of the country. That may be one of the reasons that it's not sort of spreading here. And that would make sense in the sense that we have a huge Chinese and Asian community here in Southern California, particularly Southern California, and we were getting something like uh, 7,000 people from Wuhan a day, uh, direct flights. Apparently we had direct flights coming in back in December until the block in January. So it's an interesting theory that there may be greater degrees of um, immunity here, but we won't know until there's testing. We just got to get that antibody testing going. Uh, so that will be interesting. So let me look at your uh, uh, stream, your questions here. Uh, how good is zinc for you? Zinc does have some antiviral properties and people are combining it with hydroxychloroquine with great effect. Um, Let's talk um, about mental health. All right. Uh, Mary is saying, what exactly does it mean when they say more people are going to be sick in two weeks? The peak, I suffer from severe anxiety, so it's going to drive me crazy. Mary, where are you? And let me just say, I, there are two or three things I would say about our anxiety. I, I think for me right now, depression is the issue. I don't know if you all are feeling that, the grinding quality of all this. Susan is depressed. I am depressed. And, uh, and if you're prone to depression, it's especially your biology will kind of go that way. And if you're one of these people that anxiety causes depression, this will grind you into depression as well. And so I think the kinds of things we need at times like this, uh, unfortunately it's raining here in Southern California, we need some sunlight, <laughs> we need some exercise. It never rains in California, except for when we're not allowed it, to go out. Good for the summer, you know, we'll be in good shape during the summer because our snowpack will give us plenty of water, but uh, you know. Is that because we're not driving our cars? Uh, the is, water? Is no, no. The, I don't think the weather so, but I, I'm not a meteorologist, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, Nikita, you're asking about those direct flights from China. Yeah, so I don't, again, there's a, there's a piece, there's a study that just went around that was bringing up this issue. I have no opinion on it. I'm just raising it as an issue that's starting to circulate around here in Southern California. It's an interesting thought. Of course, we don't know anything about the herd immunity until we do the testing. Um, so uh, back to the mood disturbance and the anxiety. Um, acting out is not going to help people's mood. It actually makes things worse. Um, so it's about reaching out and trying to be of help. Uh, the people like, you know, donating to these, uh, these organizations we are going to be, uh, we are going to be okay. highlighting here today and, and also, every day. Also, don't take too much Xanax. Do, who's taking a lot of Xanax? What, uh, what's happening? I don't know. I just think... Some people think Xanax is the answer because they can't sleep and then... No, 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 you because know. you'll rebound on the other side of that. I mean, it feels good for a moment. It's nice to get the relief, but on the other side, you'll get a rebound and more anxiety. How do you so feel about marijuana um, instead in place of yeah, it? Yeah, I mean... I, or I, CBD. CBD, I think, is your better bet. I mean, cannabis has lots of other... Un, uh, cannabis can, in some individuals, make panic worse, and so that's why I worry about that. CBD looks like it's uh, probably something that's um, useful. We have our friends at Social, Social CBD. CBD. Social CBD. It's reasonable to go to them and Thank get their you. products. Uh, it's, for some people, it's very good for sleep as well. But, no, I mean, that's a good answer, especially if somebody has an addiction past, right? Yes, cannabis, not such a good now, idea. Now, if you're on Xanax and you have to get off of it, can you just taper it down and add melatonin and then... For sleep, yeah, if you're only taking it once a day. If you're taking it several times a day, you need to talk to a doctor about it. Uh, it, it, it you can taper it down, but if you're an addict, tapering can, can be very, very unpleasant, very difficult, and you really need to be in the hands of somebody that... Uh, 
can can knows how to use medications to help you with that withdrawal. Are sleeping pills um, a better op- option? Same problem. Same problem. Gina is uh, saying cannabis triggers my panic attacks. Yep, so that happens. Uh, Monique <laughs> says benzodiazepine is like dancing with the devil. Devil, yes, that's exactly right. I mean, if one or two doses relief, good. But after that, if you stay with it regular, it can be really. How do you feel about rum? I worry the same thing as I do about the alcohol. Uh, <laughs> the other side is where it, it may work in the moment, and uh, but you know the other side. Um, yeah, uh, Joe A, just taper down uh, was not what I said. No, I said, I, said if, I asked uh, if we should just taper down. Uh, tapering down can be really rough, and it needs to be done in, in capable hands. And, a, and there's medicines that can be used to reduce some of the uh, withdrawal feelings, which can be quite, quite intense. And some people are hypersensitive to benzodiazepines, where even you know small reductions and of, from small doses can trigger big biological responses. So you really need to be careful with these. Joshua wants to know if I'm popping pills. No, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm asking for a friend. Uh, let me. But also we haven't talked about this in so long and this is a huge problem that's behind the scenes. You know, yep. it's not, it, it was bad before. These drug, drug and alcohol. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Listen, addiction is still taking a hundred thousand people a year. So this year addiction right? will, take, will take more people than COVID. I, uh, and let's talk about it. Well, it's just a fact. Uh, and we're doing better. And we're reducing it. Suicide is expected to go up. And so we are very concerned about it. You want to learn more Go to SAMHSA, let me get to their website, S-A-M-H-S-A.gov, SAMHSA.gov. They have a bunch of mental health uh, resources there uh, in terms of treatment, uh, telemedicine. There's going to be a big push to do more telemedicine and telemental health services from organizations like SAMHSA. SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration from the federal government. And this homepage at SAMHSA.gov is very good. They have programs, they have data, they have public messaging there to help prevent suicide, know the risk of cannabis, know the risk of meth, a lot of stuff there. Living well with serious mental illness, they have those sorts of resources there. I personally um, am going to contact SAMHSA and talk to them about how practitioners can more easily get involved. I'm going to put myself into their telehealth um, system nice. and, and do some of that work and see what it's like and what the what the I, I'm hoping they will come up with standards of practice. Let me look up, they have a practitioner training site. Mm, yeah, they need like clinical guidelines and things like that and best practices. So I will, I will spend a little time this weekend looking into that. So uh, yeah, that we need an army of people at, at SAMHSA and in telehealth organizations like that. Also, the VA is going to ramp up its telehealth services or has already. Somebody asked me for a site. I don't know, a site for what? Uh, I would start with SAMHSA. Uh, it's just uh, S-A-M-H-S-A. S-A-M-H-S-A dot gov, SAMHSA dot gov. Go to the homepage. There's lots of resources there. You also can go to the National Student Mental Health. Let's see. Let's go to the I-N-I-M-H dot, uh, whoops. N-I-M-H. What was it? I-M-H? N-I-M-H. Let me see what the N-I- acronym is. I- uh, the N-I-M-H, National Student Mental Health. Uh, and I, uh, no, it's N-I-M-H dot N-I-H dot gov. That's their website. N-I-M-H dot N-I-H dot gov. Uh, and that's a little easy, more, that's a little more higher level kinds of stuff, but it's lots of good resources. Lots of everybody real, check that make sure I typed it right. N I M H dot N I H dot gov. Uh, it's a little more, um, it's a little, um, you know, more sophisticated in some ways. SAMHSA is really about getting, getting people in. And then of course the VA has their own services as well. <clears throat> we need to check in on our addicts too. Uh, yes, we do. I, I, you know, I just talked to an addict patient just a few minutes ago who was saying she really dug the Zoom meetings. That there are, so, so there are some people that are really benefiting from these Zoom meetings if they have any kind of social anxiety or difficulty attending meetings. This Zoom, I know lots of my patients are complaining about the Zoom meetings, but there's an upside to that. Uh, uh, G State Forever is saying that Fauci has updated his numbers. I think that is probably correct. Uh, but again, you know, the bigger challenge, as I've said from the beginning, is how we get out of this, how we get people back to work without yeah. triggering a second peak and all this. If, uh, if you look at the history of the Spanish flu, the second peak was uh, more problematic. Um, Pennsylvania's got a six days till their peak in deaths, but their peak death rates are plummeting right now. They, they will, uh, they've already peaked, really, but they're going to be at around, that seems to have been just an aberration, and they're going to be about 40 per day. 
the peak for the, you look very much like California. Uh, peak is in about April 12th in terms of resource utilization, April 13th, and you're going to easily meet those needs. So Pennsylvania is looking pretty good. The, the places I, I worry about are in Connecticut and Massachusetts, and some of that is people coming out of New York. Uh, and then New Jersey seems to be finding its way out. Uh, they, they've really had to, uh, had to struggle. The total deaths in Pennsylvania are predicted to only be 969, which is pretty darn good in a state the size of Pennsylvania. Uh, again, compared to other, other uh, fatalities during that same interval, you'll see that uh, COVID's doing quite, quite, quite well. Um, again, I'll remind you, our friends at Angel Food, Angel, Project Angel Food, uh, dot com slash uh, COVID is where you, COVID-19. 19. Project Angel Food dot com slash COVID-19 is where you can be, make a difference for that organization. Uh, all right. Uh, looking at your restream now to see what you guys are thinking about. Um, Makes everybody anxious and irritated and depressed. This whole thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, somebody's asking about Kratom. I, I worry about Kratom. I have uh, friends that use it. Um, uh, even recovering people that use it, it's a weak opiate. And from my perspective, using a weak opiate is dangerous. So it just worries me. Again, you got to remember, you know, our, our job is to, you know, not put you at risk if you're taking, you know, recommend something. Uh, good question about Amy, about once the uh, vaccine becomes available, will it be combined with the yearly flu vaccine? I suspect eventually it will. I don't know initially if it will. I suspect not because they're going to have to study its uh, full effect. Um U.S. is peaking in two days, and other states are so far behind. Uh, yeah, yes, that's true, uh, and that's because the uh, USA numbers are a conglomerate. They're they're all states taken in total, and some are going to peak sooner than later. It's a it's a it's an average that we're looking at here. Uh, okay, Texas. Let's look at Texas. Uh, our phone is ringing in spite of being off the hook. We don't know how that happens. Uh, it's you no, know, it's uh, something where it's ringing in a in a place where we don't even have a line. <laughs> Texas is looking good, uh, peaking in 13 days. So much like Oklahoma, Texas is way behind, but you're not going to get into real trouble provided you keep your social distancing and uh, masks and all those good things. The death rate is peaking at 15 at about 66. Again, we will see whether novel therapeutic therapeutics will have any real uh, effect on that. And total deaths around 2,000. And let's see if we can bring that down. Wouldn't that be nice if the doctor's sophistication with this does so? Um, what's up with the mask being mandatory? That's in California. I don't know about other areas. Um, I think masks are a good idea. Uh, I think that makes a why not. It's a why not. And especially in New York where the elevator and the train, I think we're really going to have found to be the vectors of all this. There's some, there's some novel infecting quality about New York. And I'd say it's the elevator. Uh, and thereby, uh, don't go in elevators if you don't have to. And if you do, wear a mask. Tennessee. Uh, again, you can go to covid19.healthdata.org, but I will look at Tennessee. They were looking really good yesterday. And I'm assuming it is the same today. Yes, you're going to peak about April 17th, eight days, easily meet your resource demands, nine days till a uh, death for day peak, um, peaking around 25. But you've just taken a a dive there down to 12 recently. It'll be interesting to see if it perhaps that's an interesting state to watch. Maybe their death rates, maybe everyone over at uh, Vanderbilt is getting some uh, real, real uh, learning, a rapid learning, a, a high, you know, a steep learning curve on this virus and learning how to get people off these ventilators. Uh, thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. I'm glad you're, congratulations on your sobriety. Um, I'm hearing hydroxychloroquine is showing more and more promise if given it upon positive test. It, it, the hydroxychloroquine stories are still all over the place. Uh, I know Dr. Oz is still extremely enthusiastic about that. If you remember, you can sign up on his homepage at DrOz.com. If you are a lupus patient on Plaquenil, he's trying to find somebody who has developed COVID as a lupus patient on Plaquenil. The theory is that you would expect a lupus patient, the lupus patient would be more prone to the virus and certainly more prone to the complications. And yet those on Plaquenil, we are seeing that they are not getting uh, this, this infection at all. Uh, as I said, zinc is being used with hydroxychloroquine, and that seems to be an important, uh, um, important uh, element. You're asking, can the virus live in pools? It does not appear to be waterborne. Uh, as far as Atlanta, I gave you the Georgia numbers a minute ago, and uh, now somebody's asking about Wisconsin. So let me see if I can come up with that for you. Again, you can check yourself anytime you wish at covid19.healthdata.org. Uh, Wisconsin is going to peak in about four days. 
Uh, they're going to meet their resource demands. Uh, they're going to be about 900 patients at the peak, six days till the fatality peak. You too have been bouncing around with uh, improved fatality rates. So let's see if that stays that way. Um, the peak is expected. Whoop, my, here goes my computer. I did turn the computer off and restart it, and uh, yet it's. I've got this. You know, I was this, on that site yesterday on my computer, and it the, the little the wheel of, of uh, death. Death was spinning <laughs> so, too. So it's the website. It's about six days. There's probably so many people on it at yeah, the same time. It's probably true. In about six days, it peaks uh, at about 20. Uh, and let's see if we can even drive that down further. That would be nice. Uh, yeah, we'll give it a minute to kind of reset itself. Uh, let me go back on the restream. It's with not you your know? computer. It's okay. just the website. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I, Brown Hulk is saying, I think we need more confirmation of the uh, benefits of hydroxychloroquine before, before we get behind it fully. I completely agree with you. Um, uh, Tom, your governor of Michigan does not believe the COVID-19 uh, health data. Um, I, you know, I, we hear the same thing from our mayor in Los Angeles and from the governor in California. And I would argue that the governors and the mayors, uh, need to be looking at worst case scenarios. Uh, that those are the, those are the, you, uh, the rest of us can look at probabilities and look at good, reliable sites out of University of Washington, Dr. Murray, and say, isn't this good? It's, it's thus far been highly predictive, and it seems to be predicting things very accurately, and we can talk about it. But if you're governor and you're making decisions for the resources for a state, you need to prepare for the worst case until it's very clear you're on the other side. So having the governors and the mayors talk about things being worse, uh, I think that's appropriate to what their job is. Uh, blood types do not seem to affect the virus, but there is some research, let's say, being done. There's some stuff being talked about in terms of how red cells bind hemoglobin and how that's figuring into this whole thing. Uh, do zinc supplements help? We have no data on that, uh, but p the zinc with the hydroxychloroquine seems to be an important combination. Do I have concerns for a second wave? Yes, I have profound concerns for a second wave. That, that as I've been saying from the beginning, I think is the biggest the biggest problem. We're going to have to maintain social distancing. We're not going to be in crowds anymore for a long time. Uh, and the potential for a second wave, I, I mean, you're, what you're going to hear about, hopefully today or tomorrow from Dr. Fauci, is how he wants to identify and contain. So we, we go back, once we get on the backside of this thing towards the end of the month, which is, which is coming, you can start to see it coming now. Uh, you're seeing everybody adjust their numbers downward and things starting to look better and the full effect of our behavior coming to bear and the improvisations of the U.S. healthcare system having its full effect. Um, you're going to see he's going to start talking about more widespread testing, some sort of systematic way of identifying where there are people who are at risk and then how to isolate them. Uh, uh, Mark, I'm not quite sure what you mean by second wave more. All we're saying is that there if we all go back to interacting the way we used to, so let's say we go from where we are now. Let's say it's California. And we all of a sudden just go, sorry, we're turning the light back on. We're all going to, Disneyland is open. Theaters are open. We're going back to work. Um, what you will see is a new graph. A new graph will emerge that will look just like the first one, uh, except it will take off and accelerate until we start to social distance again and start to isolate. So what we want to do is have the number of cases, the presence of the virus at such a low level that we can identify where it is. We can identify it and contain it rather than mitigate the distribution. So that's that's their next job. I don't know how they do it. I know that's the, the theory of uh, they'll be operating from, but uh, we will see how that goes. Uh, people will still get sick and people will still die. That's the unfortunate reality of that. But as the um, weather warms up, it should be less. And then how about hopefully. hot like hot weather areas right now? How do they compare to us? Because I, I was looking at the graph. I can't remember which country it was, but... I noticed the warmer weather areas had less cases of right, death. Right, except, except um, Australia was an outlier, so no, it's hard to say. Australia the, seems low. Yeah, yeah. Because it's summer there. That's what so, it was. So if you look at Florida, um, they're way behind, right, because they closed down early. That will be an interesting sort of um, one to watch. Uh, we are at April 9th here. I think it was Australia. Uh, You're right. I was, And then I thought, oh, it's summer there. Yeah, and so so here's the and deal. It was on fire. Like, well, and then in Africa, for certain parts of Africa, people take hydroxychloroquine regularly. So people started looking at that. So I I don't know what to make of all that because South America has plenty of plenty of COVID too. So I, I just don't know what to Although make. Although Tom yet. Hanks got it there. Right, um, Florida though we might keep an eye on because uh, it's gonna it's hotter there. Right? It's gonna heat up soon presumably, uh, and they're a couple weeks behind, uh, and they may not peak until about April 21st. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. 
Uh, that's and let's compare that to say what goes on in New England and Massachusetts and uh, Connecticut, where there's a very similar concern going on there. What uh, happened with the stock market? I haven't looked. Uh, I don't know. I just quit looking. Uh, okay. Let's Somebody see. said stock market help. Don't sell. Uh, I'm trying to read your comments here. Uh, boy, it's raining like crazy here in Southern California. Uh, you know, one thing we need to we need to start to pay attention to is the disproportionate uh, complications uh, in the uh, African American and Latino communities and that ha that are economically distressed. Uh, there's a, a lot. People need to pay attention to that. People need to continue to pay attention to that. Once this is over, this is something that my profession has been aware of for a long time. And we have done woefully little to change that. Um, I've noticed that the uh, attorney, the Surgeon General of the State of California, has started to talk about adverse childhood experiences and its 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 impact on our health. And uh, I would love to see her make that connection and see if we can, because no one's ever done that as a way of trying to up the well-being and health of certain populations that live in poverty when they're children and thereby have more adverse childhood experiences. So I'll be anxious to see her initiatives as we come out of this, because that will be an important place to look for solutions. Uh, okay, yeah. So um, uh, Daniel, your sister is a pharmacist, and she's seeing a lot of hydroxychloroquine going out uh, for COVID. Yes, I know doctors are prescribing a lot of it, and patients are demanding it. They are demanding it. They are demanding tests. They are demanding uh, hydroxychloroquine. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous if, if the patients are dictating care. We as physicians need to figure out best practices. We don't have them yet. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm for hydroxychloroquine, but exactly who should be using it is still something a bit up in the air. Uh, and, and whether it can be used as a prophylactic agent. Again, these are hard calls. You know, if somebody is, let's say they're 75 years old and somebody in their household develops COVID, do you treat them early with hydroxychloroquine? I, I, it's a very, very challenging question. Um, Sweden says, uh, let's see, Sweden says it's inevitable. Uh, yeah, no, so Sweden's going for herd immunity. I'm aware of that. Uh, why is Germany rising again after four days? Let me look at that. Yeah, That's Germany seemed low, but they, you know what, they have a lot of beds and a lot of ventilators and a lot of... Germany does? Yeah, I, was, I saw that last night. Like, they have lots of open beds because they have a ton Germany of them. Germany is broken down into a lot of different regions in, in my thing here, so... I was looking at the beds versus the, you know, patients. Yeah. And they were, they had so many beds. All right, so let me... Um, I was looking internationally. I'll just go to the Rhineland. Uh, I think I think uh, Chechnya had like three deaths, <laughs> like yeah. a really low number. They just shut down their borders and said, not again. Right. Uh, Either that or they're not reporting it. Who knows? I, I don't know these different regions in uh, Germany, but they're all looking pretty good. It, they have a lot of hospitals. And, and I'm not seeing it re-peak. I'm seeing it just a little choppy. Uh, let me see. I, and I don't have, unfortunately, a, a combined number for all. I, I, there, it's... You know, some of it is that it's some of the areas are peaking late yeah. uh, and some of the areas are peaking early. And it's really the data is very, they must not be getting good data because it's the confidence intervals are all over the place. And uh, I mean, it makes sense. They country. had a lot of beds, a lot of uh, ICUs. Uh, beds. Let me, ICU beds. All right, let me pull that up and see how that looks. I, that's what I noticed. I'm, I don't know. A, I, a it lot, was my yeah, first time reading the graphs. And, so and I they're not using a lot of them either. There's only like 100 beds needed in ICUs and things. So... Yeah. yeah, I mean, Germany's another healthcare system people should look at. Uh, when, whenever, you know, people start talking about Canada, people that are in the know will say, yeah, look at Germany there. <laughs> they kind of they kind of have a good system. Um, Maybe Baden-Württemberg. Uh, yeah, again. Bermuda I'm, had like two deaths. In the city, in the island of Bermuda? Yeah. Or three, maybe four. I so um, I'm not seeing that second peak you guys are talking about. I'm just seeing a lot of variability in the data. So um, Those are the places I was looking at. Yeah. Random. But I, what about Mexico? I haven't even thought about that. Okay, let's look at Mexico. Let me see if I can come up with some data on that. I, know, you could spend I, all day I know that we eventually in this country are going to be um, exporting. Um, oh, here's, I think I got Mexico. No, I got New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to be exporting, um, you know, medical gear soon to other countries. I'm sure of that. 
Somebody said uh, it's 91 degrees in, in uh, Florida right now. Well, uh, so it'll be interesting to compare Florida. With that. I'm having computer problems. <laughs> uh, it'll be interesting to compare Florida to New England because that's those are two areas that have the same kind of pattern setting up, and we'll see if the temperature in one region affects you know, what's going on. No, in, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, yes, they're looking into the blood types, Butch. Uh, there are those studies out there. Uh, does fasting up with the immune system? I, I, the, you know, um, Peter Atia was addressing that in some of his Instagrams, and he was saying we cannot really make recommendations on that yet, and I thought that was a smart position. Um, it's not his computer. He doesn't need a I was on the website yesterday, too. No, I, I get it, but the problem is it, it locks up regularly here. So, um, Why is pancreatic cancer, I guess you're asking, so hard to test for? Because there is no blood test for the, you know, you... You almost have to pick it up at the level of a few cells. And by the time we can see it, it's the kind of cancer that, you know, cancers are uncontrolled cells of a particular type. In this case, it's pancreas cells that suddenly start growing uncontrollably. One of the features of these pancreatic cancer cells is they very rapidly break into the bloodstream. As soon they just they don't stay as a whole solid tumor. They start breaking off and going all over the place before we can detect it. So until we come up with some sort of marker. But even then, how will we locate it and what we do about it? And, it, it, you know, within a week, it could, you know, be, it's a very difficult cancer to, to I mean, uh, okay, Florida has a high amount of elderly people living there. Yes, yes, right? it does. So yes, you would think that we'd have a lot more deaths. Um, yeah, yes, you, you would. Uh, but again, we, you know, Florida's still early in its thing, right? It's, it's but got maybe a, also because of the weather, it's not as much. It's an interesting spread. question. You're, I, these are all questions I mean, we should all keep an eye on. So it's two weeks till they're peaking their death rate, but they're only going to peak at about 149. So your point is well taken. Uh, Thank you. And it compared to California, which let's say is going to peak at, let's see how many deaths we're likely to peak with here. We're peaking at around uh, eh, only 64. So we're doing pretty good here too. Uh, and, and again, it's compared to New York, which is very difficult to look at these numbers. Um, around seven, you know, they've been around 7,800. Now, the interesting thing will be to see whether it falls off fast, how fast it falls off. It's, we're in the peak right now for uh, deaths in New York City, as well as uh, in the peak, uh, essentially in the peak for utilization of resources. I'm expecting uh, that Dr. Murray from University of Washington should be adjusting his graphs tomorrow, so we can, it'll be very interesting to see what, what these things look like then. Um, no, uh, Florida does not look like it's in trouble. Florida needs to stay diligent, but it's not going to be in trouble. Uh, mm -hmm. Can the virus live in a fridge or freezer? I'm betting it can live in a refrigerator, but not a freezer, but I don't have specific data on that. Mm. Um, how does plasma from a survivor help? So when, you have, when you've convalesced from this virus, you have all this immunity, right? You have all these antibodies, and you could take these. The, the antibodies are the same for the virus no matter who produces them. So when you, if, if, to some... It, that's a little bit true, so sort of true. So you can take the antibodies from one person, type and cross them, just like you do the plasma for any other plasma exchange or blood blood transfusion, and you get those antibodies, you infuse them into a person who's fighting the virus, and then they have all those antibodies to fight it off, and it's working. It's an old-fashioned move. It's, a, it's way back in the early days of vaccine therapies that people started thinking about things like this. Uh, um... Uh, Lori, I hope so. You're right on Massachusetts. We'll see the data tomorrow when they adjust the graphs. Okay, I think uh, this about does it. We appreciate you guys being here. Don't forget the uh, Project Angel Food uh, uh, website. Uh, Projectangelfood.com slash COVID-19 is where you can contribute. We want you to do that and support all the different, the different uh, charities we'll be highlighting here. We have more coming. We're going to get some from New York who are doing a wonderful job as well. Um, I'm worried it can stay in the, the fridge, Johanna. I'm not sure. So wash everything. You <laughs> I know, love wash how you do hands. that. He's answering questions. I know. The stuff I see that I, we got to okay. keep it going. Johanna's so, worried now. You got her all worried. Maybe uh, don't we'll worry. find out. Just uh, don't. It's not foodborne. It's not foodborne. It does not appear to be food it's or waterborne. It's not in sushi. It, it does not appear to be in sushi. It does not appear to be foodborne. These are all things to think about. I mean, if your, your sushi guy sneezes on your sushi and he's got it, right. that, that it, wouldn't be something. It's things to be aware of. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we're doing it. Listen. You're doing an amazing job. It's amazing to me that we live in a country where we don't need an authoritarian government to come in and brick us into our houses. We have <laughs> leaders that stand up and go, would you please help your community and not walk around? You may be asymptomatic, shedding virus. On behalf of everyone else, stay home, and you'll protect yourself at the same time. Let's do it. Our governor has asked us to, to do this in many states, and we just did it. 
We did it, and it had an extraordinary effect, and we're reaping the benefits of the numbers, and we should celebrate our collective effort here. It's extraordinary. If we can have the same collective and sort of digging our way out of this, we're going to be fine. But uh, how we do that, I don't quite fully get yet, but hopefully I will have uh, the government will give us some idea of how they're doing so. Uh, do you know when we're going to have that doctor in here, Susan? Either tomorrow at 3, because okay. we'll be back tomorrow at 3 for everybody okay. here. And I'm not really advertising it because I don't want a bunch of trolls to pop on. Okay, so I like these guys, though. Um, and then, or sometime on Saturday if that doesn't work out. Okay, we're, I'm looking to talk to a doctor that's improvising. Dr. Thomas Yadig Yeager. Yadiger. Yadiger. Yeah, Yadiger. And uh, he's a really, you, you, you'll see how physicians improvise in this country and how the wonderful ideas they come up with and how effective they are and how quickly they get skilled yeah. at uh, applying these things. It'll be it's interesting. Just, it's just fantastic. So We're we'll going to try to get some more guests like that and yeah. get some more information. And if you have uh, suggestions, uh, you know, put them on the restream here or send them to drdrew.com slash contact. We'll yeah. Well, I'm not really looking at emails right now because I've been over inundated with so much other stuff. So, um yeah, probably better just to post it here during tomorrow's stream if you okay. have any good ideas. Okay. Uh, thank you, guys, and we'll see you tomorrow. Stay well.